most of my lab at this time is actually focused on the genetics of an autoimmune disease called alopecia areata, which is uh, an autoimmune condition where the hair follicle is attacked by uh, immune cells. And so we've done quite a bit of work on the genetics of that. We've developed uh, preclinical pre animal testing for new drug therapies, and now we've helped to accelerate clinical trials. So it's really been a, a huge team effort over the past five or so years, uh, but one that's really turned out to be quite rewarding uh, and very exciting for us as basic scientists to be able to participate in clinical trials and, and new clinical research. Our lab at the moment is really largely focused on alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune disease where the body begins to attack the hair follicle. Over the past five or so years, we've worked out most of the genetics, at least the easy part uh, of alopecia areata, and used that information to uh, design new animal studies and test new unexpected uh, therapies for alopecia areata using FDA-approved drugs. And so it's been a real exciting experience for us to move from basic genetics into animal studies into the clinic, uh, something that's really turned out to be very exciting. I think one of the main findings in alopecia areata that was uh, exciting and new for us was sort of turning over the old idea that um, perhaps alopecia areata was most related to skin autoimmune diseases like psoriasis or atopic dermatitis. Um, and what the genetics showed us really was that we were more aligned at the genetic level to unexpected diseases, celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and type 1 diabetes. And just using that simple shift in direction really opened our eyes to a whole different way of looking at disease pathogenesis. And by taking a lesson from those other conditions, we turned our attention to different signaling pathways that then that had previously been looked at in alopecia, which then in turn led us to predicting uh, a new class of drugs called JAK inhibitors that might actually work to target some of those pathways. So uh, most of the excitement really was led by uh, new insights into the genetics, which then triggered a whole uh, new cascade in terms of where the disease took us and new treatments that could be uh, predicted maybe based on genetic targets. We've already had tremendous uh, feedback from patients with alopecia areata who are taking these drugs, either in the setting of clinical trials or privately with their own physicians. And the results have really been surprisingly dramatic. Um, many patients, if not most, have had significant hair regrowth as a result of taking a JAK inhibitor. And these are, in many cases, patients who'd had long-standing uh, total hair loss who had been unresponsive to just about anything else that they had tried. And so the early feedback is from practitioners, from dermatologists, as well as patients, that maybe uh, this is finally a new class of drugs that will hold some shorter-term hope uh, for alopecia patients. Because these are already FDA-approved drugs, uh, there's the chance for repurposing, maybe seeking a new indication for the same drug, or uh, what's happened in the past year, um, new interest on the part of uh, drug companies in starting drug trials primarily for alopecia areata, which is also new. Uh, having trials designed specifically for this disease, uh, I think will really help accelerate getting these treatments into the hands of patients in a quick manner. As president of the SID this year, um, I've really taken on two main uh, themes to try and advance, both through the society and through next year's meeting. Uh, one is to uh, enhance academic industry partnerships. So much of our work has been uh, really accelerated in the past few years by joining together with companies to test some new therapies, uh, that it was already a nascent theme in the society, but one that I had hoped to bring uh, further along next year in the program. But the other one actually uh, became very evident this year and really is something close to my heart, and that is to begin to expand uh, inclusion and diversity in themes uh, for the society, in particular uh, the formation of a new com a committee uh, that will deal with uh, inclusion and diversity as a group, both through our program, through our educational activities, the inclusion of uh, women, of people of different backgrounds, of scientists and researchers of different ages and stages, whether they're in industry, academia, government, different geographies. So really embracing the diverse nature of both the SID, the ESDR, and many of the other societies. So I hope that that will be a longer lasting theme than just beyond my presidency, but in fact something that will uh, live through the society for a long time. 
It's been a wonderful meeting uh, here at the ESDR this year, both as president and also as one of your invited keynote speakers. Uh, it's been a tremendous honor to represent the SID here this year. Uh, the ESGR meeting has always had a special place for me because it gives me a chance to see the way international fellows coming to our lab actually experience science and research in the field from across the world. And it's such a completely different mix of young people uh, and senior scientists that it gives us a wonderful perspective on what you all bring to us each year at the SID. We hope we can share some of that by bringing it back to you uh, as I hope we've done this year. But it's a meeting that I look forward to and I hope to be back in the future. Well, as a scientist, um, it's of course the thrill of discovery that keeps us all going, I think. Finding something that you see for the first time before anyone else in the world can see it. That excitement that comes with that first thrill is something I experienced early in my career and has stayed with me uh, all this time. But also as a patient, so I have alopecia areata and it was my own experience with the disease that really sparked us down this line of research. And I think Finding out when you're newly diagnosed and, and you're told, I, we don't know what causes this, we can't tell you if you're going to get better or worse or stay the same and there's not much we can do about it, was very unsatisfying to me as a scientist and as a patient. And so I think really bringing that home and using research as a tool to uh, advance uh, treatments and to try and make that first diagnosis a little less traumatic to particularly alopecia patients. Uh, is really a major goal of ours now to come with new options that have a real chance of working based on science is more rewarding than I think I could have ever imagined. I think for me I've had the great opportunity to have two main um, exciting periods in my career. One was of course my postdoctoral fellowship when I had the privilege of working in Yoni Wito's lab in Philadelphia just at the time that epidermolysis bullosa was exploding in terms of its genetics. And it was the right time, the right place, the right environment, the right colleagues. Uh, and was, I think, looking back, really a magical four years of protected time when all we had to worry about was doing this wonderful science. Um, and then I have to say more recently, the work on alopecia areata uh, has been a huge surprise. We always hoped that genetics would help live up to its promise of, of taking us through to new targets, but I, I never dreamed it would happen quite as quickly as it has or, or quite as effectively as it has. So this to me has also been a tremendously privileged time to sort of be uh, at the front of this charge for opening up new doors in alopecia. I think for me, uh, working in hair research, one of the toughest challenges has always been to uh, secure sufficient research funding for the work. And so hair research, I think, is unique in a way because uh, its t tendency is to disregard it and, or dismiss it somehow as cosmetic. It it's, doesn't really make you sick. It, it quote, just your appearance. And certainly for patients with hair disorders, nothing could be further from the truth. And yet, <clears throat> working hard to raise sufficient funds to support that work has been uh, a huge challenge, but one that I hope that we'll be fortunate enough to, uh, to break through. And I think for me personally, um, now as I look back uh, and I realize you know, what the next decade of my life will be like, I suppose in my heart I've always been a dermatologist, but I never went to medical school or completed training. And so as a PhD scientist now looking ahead, uh, I somehow wish that I had gone and become an MD-PhD so that I could do all aspects of the work that we are now uh, doing. So um, something I suppose if I could do it all again, I ought to have gotten my formal degree as a dermatologist and not just an honorary one. Mm -hmm.